be very challenging. Senator Patterson, I hand to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Professor Murphy, thank you uh, for your time again before the committee. I think it's your third appearance. And as you noted, you've just come straight from AHPPC. So uh, we're grateful with the other duties that you have that you're taking uh, your obligations to the Senate process as seriously as you are. Um, in your opening statement, uh, you noted that if Australia had a similar rate of infection and fatality as the UK, that we'd have about 15,000 fatalities rather than 100. Um, that's a very sobering statistic and um, very timely because looking back at some of the early modelling that we did uh, in the early stages, we did fear that we would on, be on a trajectory like that. Uh, in fact, um, even worse than that at one point. Um, we've, I don't want to rehash all the things we previously discussed before the committee about why that's not the case. And I certainly don't want to do uh, any, you know, to use an American expression, a Monday morning quarterbacking on the modelling that was done early on because they're obviously under extreme pressure and had very limited data. Um, but touch wood, thankfully, in Australia, what has eventuated is nowhere near even the best case scenarios outlined in that early modelling. Is that a fair observation? Yes, Senator. Although that, that early modelling was really designed to give us a sense of what uh, an unmitigated outbreak would do. We didn't ever believe we would have an unmitigated outbreak. And then to apply on that early modelling a series of mitigations to get to a situation where we thought uh, we could manage within an expanded health system capacity, particularly critical care capacity. So we, we put a range of mitigations around the model so that we knew that we would be able to manage within a ventilator capacity of 7,000. And that was then what we sort of set up as our worst case scenario, which was lot, a lot better than an unmitigated outbreak. And then we set out to beat that as much as we could by aggressive suppression. So it is true to say that we've done as well as I could have expected. Um, and because of all of those things we've talked about before, the widespread testing, the early testing, the border measures, the physical distancing, the quarantine and isolation. But the modelling was never a real world. It was designed to give us a sense of what we had to do to have a self health system that was not going to be overwhelmed, because that that is what no Australian would have tolerated, the sort of tragedy we've seen in places like New York and, you know, where you've had mobile morgues and horrible situations, and we were determined we were never going to be in that position. Oh, I think you're right, Professor Murphy. I think, in fact, um, even countries who've had uh, it much worse than Australia, but much better than New York, have had much higher death rates that Australians mm. would not be willing to accept uh, either. And in fact, almost any other country we're compared to, Australians would be aghast and horrified if we had the kind of deaths that they had. Um, but just to very gently challenge that that final statement you, there, you made there, and I say gently because I'm not only am I not an epidemiologist, I'm not anything approaching it, uh, and not in any way medically qualified, but um, as I understand it from that early modelling, it was a range of scenarios. and. It, and the modelling was predicated on, on high levels of um, social distancing and lower levels of social distancing. So, for example, on the, the ICU um, daily uh, demand, it ranged from 5,000 at the low end, assuming a relatively high degree of control, and at 35,000 at the high end. On deaths, uh, 50,000 at the low end and 150,000 at the high end, making different assumptions about how effective social distancing was. Um, thank God we haven't even come anywhere near the bottom, uh, mm -hmm. the best case scenario in that. But obviously, pro policy was predicated on that. I mean, that was the only information available at the time for policymakers, wasn't it? So policy was predicated on that as a, a managed worst case. The lower end was what we planned as our worst case scenario. What we would we we wanted to know that we had the tools in place to manage what we th within uh, a maximal ICU expansion capacity. We calculated from ground up that. No, anything more than 7,000 ICU beds, we just couldn't staff. So we, yep. so we looked at the modelling and said, what do we have to do in this somewhat artificial situation of a community-wide outbreak to bring it down to that level? And that was really the purpose of that modelling. But, and and we, we wanted to reassure governments collectively that we had the tools in our kit bag to manage down to within health system capacity. And that was the main purpose of that modelling. It wasn't a prediction, but it was to say, no. we've got these tools and this is 
this is how each of them will work. And it was really important to convince governments to do physical distancing. That was a huge challenge for all of our governments to cancel major events, close restaurants, put people out of work. Uh, but we, we had to show the impact of physical distancing from modelling work. Yep. Yeah, and I think that was a useful illustration of um, the range of possibilities available to us, depending mm. on the different approaches that government took, but also the different approaches that citizens took and, and their compliance um, mm. with those directions. Um, obviously, though, uh, on the basis in part of that modelling, governments um, envisage that we would have quite s serious uh, restrictions in place. And the, the mantra at the time was that it could be in place for up to six months. Um, happily, that down, now doesn't appear to be the case. Uh, we're really only two months into those restrictions and now they're being eased. Um, so policy that was predicated on, on, six, on a six month uh, restriction scenario uh, is obviously going to be um, quite out of step for what ends up being a two month scenario, isn't it? Correct. And I think we, we have reflected that we've done a lot better than we thought we would have at this stage. Um, we, the, the epidemic pandemic is under much better control at this stage than we thought, um, which, is, which is wonderful. Um, but I think we, and certainly there will be some measures in place for six months, but we, it was quite possible we could have had to continue quite severe measures for a lot longer than, than is currently the case. That's absolutely true, Senator. Yep. And, um, and I don't want to ask you to stray too much beyond your area of expertise. And correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think you have economics qualifications. Do no, you? Senator. <laughs> no. But, but just to tempt you just a little bit, um, economic policy that was predicated on six months of restrictions uh, and far higher rates of ICU admission, infection and deaths uh, is obviously, and, and was and formed on that basis of those models, uh, is obviously going to need to change quite significantly given that that hasn't turned out to be uh, what we feared it was. So I, I probably not probably uh, co can't comment on economics. All I can say Treasury is Secretary, that... Secretary, wouldn't you say, Senator Patterson? <laughs> that, that well, every, we might yet have another opportunity, Chair. Mm. Everything, there is no... The, the challenge with this pandemic, Senator, is that there's no clear model or path. We're all finding our way. Every country's finding our way. Um, we're all looking at the data every day and re-evaluating our, our position in the health as in all the other responses. So um, it is a very uncertain time and we still don't clearly have the end game because uh, we don't know about vaccines and the like. So there is a lot of uncertainty, but, uh, but we're very pleased to be in the position we're in at the moment. Okay, just one final question on, on indulgence then uh, on along these lines. Looking back, knowing what you know now, uh, what, if anything, would you have done differently or advise governments to do differently? Um, potentially, we... I can't... I can't... I would have liked to have formally hotel quarantine people a little earlier because we were being... Most of our cases at that time were coming from overseas travellers, but it was just there wasn't the room in hotels to do it. So I don't think it would have been practical. So we did it as soon as we could have done. But other than that, I, um, you know, we re we question every one of our decisions. But in retrospect, I think we look back pretty pleased with the way we've responded. Okay. And sorry, I did say it was a final question, but I do have one more follow up from that. Um, obviously, you'd probably rather be in the position you are today. Uh, maybe having gone harder than you otherwise would and now being in a position to relax it than the alternative, which is not going hard enough early and being in a position where you had to catch up and, and, and impose stronger and stronger restrictions because it hadn't worked as planned. Well, I think the international evidence shows that not only that, that, is, a, that is a policy failure uh, because you can't bring it under control. Those countries that imposed restrictions late um, have had terrible devastation as they bring the pandemic under control and they still have not suppressed anywhere near the level we have. So moving early was clearly the right thing to do. I mean, absolutely no doubt about that. Great. Thank you, Chair.